All right, so uh, the book of Joel, love this uh, study, a call to repentance. This chapter speaks of, of uh, really of that particular time that is going to come upon the world. Now, we know in the book of Joel, uh, we're speaking of two periods of time. One period of time earlier in the book of Joel uh, that had passed at the time of the prophet Joel. But then another period of time, a period of time that I believe is on the horizon, that is on our horizon based on a plethora of prophecy in God's Word that have come to pass or that are, are being prepped uh, that you can see the groundwork for leading to many of the things that we read that will take place in the end of days. Ultimately, the horrific time that we read about throughout God's Word, that seven-year period of time, tribulation and great tribulation that is coming, will ultimately culminate in the second coming of Jesus Christ as conquering King of Kings. And not only will He come, but all His saints will be with Him. If you are a born-again disciple of Jesus Christ, you are a saint of God. We will be coming with Him. We will be following Him. We will first be raptured before that event takes place, and then we will come with the Lord. Praise God. What an amazing time uh, that's going to be. Well, let's pick up here in verses 1 through 3, and this is where we're spending our time this morning. In verses 1 through 3, there's so much to talk about, and, and my friends, I, I, I want to encourage you. Uh, this is one of those uh, kind of mornings, uh, perhaps we might need to put our thinking caps on. There's a lot of cross-references, a lot of things that I really want to uh, read and explain uh, to you so that we have a healthy understanding of what God's Word foretold would be taking place. And it's very important to understand in light of things that are taking place in the news today and have been taking place in the news really since 1948. But as the time rolls on, we see uh, exponentially uh, so. And so I believe that we can have a better understanding of what is being said, what is being reported, read between the lines, know what is uh, good news and fake news um, based on what God's Word says here. And here's the thing, and I'm, my, my desire is not to be political in any, in any way, shape, or form. It's not about being uh, political or anything like that. It's about being biblical. Do you all understand that? It's about being biblical. And if God's Word says something, then when He speaks, He desires for us to listen. And when He speaks, He desires for us to have an understanding into what He is saying. And there's so much um, uh, spin on things out there that even for much of the Christian church, or for some, I, maybe I should say, of the Christian church, it can get a little, uh, a little confusing at times. So I hope to clarify some of that for you this morning. So let's read through verses 1 through 3 uh, in uh, Joel, chapter 3. For behold, in those days and at that time... When I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. So God entering into judgment upon the nations, a time will come. At that time, in those days, God's word speaks about. 
You know, the, for those of you that are old enough to remember uh, before the name got changed uh, to uh, the Palestinian Authority, it was first called uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization, otherwise known as the PLO, which was founded by uh, that uh, murderous terrorist Yasser Arafat who had taken over from Yasser Arafat was Mahmoud Abbas, who is currently uh, the leader of, uh, really, it's the PLO, they just changed the name somewhat, Mahmoud Abbas. Mahmoud Abbas's uh, real name, uh, who Israel is very well aware of, is Abu Mazen. Abu Mazen is a terrorist. That, that cute little old guy that you see smiling all the time when he meets with world leaders is literally a terrorist. Murderous he is, blood on his hands, literally. Whether we're talking about the PLO, Mahmoud Abbas, the United Nations, and you know what? The United Nations are very united. They're very united against Israel. They are more united against Israel than any other nation on the face of the planet, and that is a fact, you can take me to, I don't know, wherever uh, with that. It's a fact. More than any other nation combined, Israel alone has received more condemnation from the UN Security Council than any other nation combined. It's a fact. United, yeah, not in a good way. Whether we're talking about Congresswoman uh, Omar, a Democrat from Minneapolis, who is a Somalian immigrant to the United States. We see a lot of problems brewing in our government and out of our government in the UN and globally that will all play and are all playing into the verses that we laid out before you, especially verses 1 and two, verse one, when it says, for behold, in those days and at that time, it was looking forward. It was looking forward a long time from when this was prophesied, about 2,500 years or, or so, from when, when this was originally prophesied. But this event that we're reading about that was ahead of them by a couple, two and a half millennial, is already behind us, it's taken place. In some of our lifetime, in fact, it's taken place. Because in May of 1948, May of 1948, this was fulfilled. After World War II, this was specifically fulfilled. May 14th, to be exact. And then in 1967, in May 14th, 1948, Israel was literally reborn in a day. Literally, 1967, they took control of Jerusalem. We see uh, even a dual fulfillment. The dual fulfillment would be, uh, of course, back at the time when this was uh, prophesied uh, from the Lord through the prophet Joel, speaking of uh, the return from the Babylonian um, uh, exile uh, of the Jews. That was a, some, some area in Scripture has dual fulfillment. Uh, this would be one of those. But it is speaking most specifically of the time ahead, way ahead, speaking about what took place in 48 and even in 1967. We are going to get a little bit of a lesson, I pray, understanding into some of these things today, because the rebirth of Israel was a sign. It's a, uh, many say, I say it's, it was a, a super sign, which really is getting things moving um, on God's prophetic uh, clock, so to speak. We've entered into a period of time called, since Israel became uh, resettled again in 1948, a time that we call, that God's Word calls, the latter days. We're coming to like the, like the end of the end, uh, so to speak. Beginning of the countdown that ultimately will lead to the tribulation, great tribulation. Uh, then we'll read about uh, the battle of Armageddon and culminates uh, with that. And of course, that takes place with uh, the return of Jesus and his church, his saints. 
So great fulfillment of uh, Scripture here. The Bible foretells that, uh, that really most people won't even believe. Most people won't believe. We have quite a mission field, don't we? We have quite a mission field indeed. Even though there is so much overwhelming evidence within uh, all of God's word. But then again, in the day uh, or days of Noah, the people didn't believe either. They didn't believe. They had hundreds of years, literally, to prepare. The warning went out. They didn't believe. And they perished as a result of that. Israel shall be brought forth in a day. Brought forth in a day. Look on the screen, Isaiah chapter 66, uh, verses 8 and 9. It says, who has heard such a thing? Like, like, like this is like, you know, you'd be flabbergasted over, over such news. Who's heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Verse 9, shall I bring the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I, who cause delivery, shut up the womb, says your God? That delivery, that birth is speaking of the resettling, the, the, the rebirth of the nation of Israel, which took place again May 14, 1948. Now, on going back slightly from that, uh, in November of 1947, just a few months earlier, uh, the UN General Assembly approved a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. So they, they basically said, okay, well, you know, we'll give our approval to that. On the morning of May 14th, in the morning of May 14th, 1948, um, that ended up being the last day of which I'm sure many of you have heard. Uh, it's called the British Mandate. So what happened is the People's Council uh, uh, met there in Israel to finalize uh, statehood, to finalize uh, that declaration, uh, so to speak. So at precisely 4 o'clock in the afternoon uh, at the uh, museum there in Tel Aviv, the Tel Aviv Museum is where this took place. Uh, David Ben-Gurion, who, who would end up becoming the first uh, uh, president or prime minister of, uh, of Israel, uh, of course, was there, and other leaders as well. The scroll of independence uh, was read. Then what they did is this, this uh, white paper, this is notoriously known as the white paper, issued by the British in 1930, uh, that particular uh, 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 paper uh, from them restricting the Jews to be able to immigrate into Israel was declared by them, by uh, David Ben-Gurion and those with him, null and void. Null and void. So then, after that, David Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel is established. The meeting is ended. That quick, just like that, the nation was born in a day. It's unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. Things like that don't happen, but they do happen when God says it's going to happen. Do you all realize that, that when God's word says something's going to happen, you, you know what? Like this is really, this is really deep now, okay? So really deep. So put on your thinking caps, okay? I know it's, it's, it's just so deep, when God's word says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Because God keeps his word. Because God is faithful to his word. Each and every single time. Well, at midnight, the British soldier, soldiers and the high commissioner left the now state of Israel. President Truman was swift, uh, by the way, just uh, minutes, I believe it was, if I remember correctly, in announcing the U.S.'s rec uh, recognition of the state of Israel, the first to do so, by the way. Um, praise the Lord. And then the next morning, on the 15th, Israel was attacked by Syrian, Jordanian, Iraq, I Iraqi, Lebanese, uh, and Egyptian forces. 
And then we see in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 8. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. By the way, I mean, Mark Twain uh, in the 1800s had gone through the land of Israel. I wish I had with me this morning exactly... Um, uh, the quote from him. It's really, it's a great quote. He went through the land of Israel and he said that it is absolutely desolate, good for nothing was the land. There, he said there's nothing here. There's nothing here. Absolutely desolate. Now at the time of Joel, that was far from the case. And yet we have a clear a uh, clear record and, and numerous witnesses uh, of the fact that it would end up being desolate, just as God's word said it would be. If this right here is not the word of God, then how does it know all these things before they take place? I mean, come on. That's why I love biblical prophecy. That's why I love all of prophecy in God's word, specifically end times prophecy, which speaks of the time really that we are, are in entering into here because it's an amazing faith builder. Honestly, it, it, it encourages me in the faith. Uh, from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So the Jews have been coming back since. Coming from Russia, coming from Ethiopia, coming from America, uh, they have come. Um, uh, coming from, uh, you know, all over all over, and they still are. They still are it's precisely in fulfillment of what God's word uh, says or said uh, would end up taking place. And then, of course, they regained the city of Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting. These things have taken place, and it ushered the world into the latter days, the latter days. That means time is short. That means time is short. We're out there, we're washing our car or waxing our car or, or you know, painting the house or doing this thing, doing that thing. Whatever it is that we're doing, praise God. But know this, the time is short. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, what's your exit strategy? Like, seriously, like I have an exit strategy. It's air Jesus, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's my exit strategy, you know? Rapture, okay? What's your exit strategy? I can tell you right now, you don't have one. And if you do have one, I can also tell you right now, based on the authority of God's word, it ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. But that's your choice. That's your decision, uh, you know, I, I suppose. But... Um, I choose Christ. I choose Jesus, you know. And uh, as so many here uh, have. And so we see so much here within uh, God's word of uh, uh, really that just that, that points so clearly to uh, the very, very uh, near uh, return of the Lord. A very interesting article that I just happened to read. Um, or look at uh, last night and, and this morning, uh, an amazing speech at the United, the ununited, <laughs> United Nations. Um, Israeli ambassador Danny Dannon says the Bible proves Jewish ownership of the land of Israel. I've got a photo. I should have put it up here for you. Here he is. He's the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. He used to be the deputy uh, secretary of defense in Israel. Now he's an uh, Israeli ambassador. And there he is sitting in his suit, holding up the word of God and lecturing literally the nations of the world in the center of the UN as he is seated and as he has the, the microphone explaining to them from God's word that Israel belongs to the Lord, belongs to the people uh, uh, that God has set for it to belong to, and that uh, the Jews have um, right to that land. 
They have right to that land. But remember, though, whatever, whatever God provides, Satan loves to pervert. Whatever God does, when God draws a particular line, especially when it's something prophetically even, the enemy is always pushing against that as if he could thwart God's plan. You can't thwart God's plan. God's sovereign. You can't thwart the plan of God, the will of God, the purpose of God. But this speech made by the Israeli ambassador uh, was really uh, quite an incredible uh, thing. And he really shows how uh, through the word of God or in the word of God um, that uh, the title deed uh, to, to Jewish ownership of the land of Israel, um, you know, it doesn't belong to the Palestinians. No, I should say, we call them the Palestinians like they actually are something. They're not. Uh, the so-called Palestinians. Um, that's a, a, a discussion for another day. But he continued referencing uh, the Balfour, and if you're taking notes, there's a great, great opportunity to take notes this morning. Write down these scripture references, write down certain of these key words, and, and look these things up for yourself. But the Balfour Declaration of 1917, we heard Hillary Clinton uh, <laughs> talking about that, um, uh, other leaders, uh, uh, presidents, and world leaders talking about the Balfour Declaration, B-A-L-F-O-U-R, Declaration of 1917, uh, the League of Nations mandate, that was the kind of like the, the earlier version of what would end up uh, being the United Nations, but the League of Nations mandate of 1922, the United Nations Charter of 1945, all legitimized, all, at that time, all legitimized Israel's right to self-determination. Now what they're trying to do is they're trying to rewrite history. Rewrite history. We find that even taking place in the textbook in Amer textbooks of American schools today. Rewriting the history. Uh, to me, I, you know, I'll tell you what I call it. I call it Nazi propaganda. That's what it reminds me of. Nazi propaganda. It's awful. It's an awful thing. The 1948 armistice lines that uh, ended up uh, uh, marking the... Um, the end of, of the, uh, the War of Independence there, were never considered international borders. Do you know that? They were never considered international borders. They were simply lines designating the end of the first battle in the Arab War against Israel that took place on May 15th. Okay? That's a fact, but now they're rewriting history. It's kind of like when, a, when the ball's in play, you know? You're playing, you know, uh, football or something like that, and then all of a sudden, you know, like you want to take and move the goal. You know, you can't do that. You can't do it anyhow, but I mean, you can't do that. It was the Arabs. This is what Danny Dannon said in the UN. He said it was the Arabs who insisted that the armistice lines would not be permanent borders, he added, because these lines are not borders. Did you hear that? The Arabs said that those lines would not be permanent borders. Because these lines are not borders. The Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, which are constantly talked about in the news. Every day, every time when we're seeing the news and it starts talking about those things and we're clicking it, this is all part of what God's word is talking about right here. Okay? It's, it's highly significant. To this day, do not cross any international borders, he said. They are built on strategic land for Israel's security and as agreed by parties in the Oslo Accords and the Oslo Accords, would be classified as final status issues, he concluded. Interesting. Now listen to this. Listen to this. On the issue of security, he noted that Arab leaders had chosen violence long before settlements were built. The PLO was established. Now think about this. The PLO was established in 1964, three years before the Six-Day War of 1967. So we would say, based on the facts of history, documented history, they are full of baloney. And they're trying to teach this to kids in our schools. To kids in our schools. The politicians have fallen for this baloney. Hook, line, and sinker. But God is going to deal with this very specifically. And we need to understand what God, in part, there's a number of things, what God is dealing with, why he needs to deal with this. Now listen, what did they need to liberate, Danny Dannon said. What did they need to liberate before 1967? 
the Jews did not have control of Jerusalem. What was there the need to liberate then? And in 1964, not a single settlement existed in Judah, or Judea rather, and Samaria. And still our right to exist was still rejected. Interesting. Interesting. It's just amazing how these things have gotten so twisted, so twisted, and how people just don't know the facts. They don't know the facts. Facts are facts, you know. It's kind of like some people say, well, I'm entitled to my opinion. You know what? We are all entitled to our opinion. We are all entitled to our own opinion, yes, but we are not entitled to our own facts. Opinions are opinions, but facts are facts. We are not entitled to our own facts. The facts are what they are. So let's read here in verse 2. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there. With who? All of these nations that he brings for this battle of battles, this World War III so to speak, on account of my people. So wait a minute. He's, he's literally drawing the nations in, the heathen in, to do battle. And guess what? They're going to lose. Why? On account of my people. How they treated God's people. You see, uh, let's understand something. When you come against the land of Israel, you're coming against the part of the purpose of God, the plan of God. Like, I mean, the world doesn't understand. We as, as, as disciples of the Lord, as, as, as followers, as Christians, we understand that God's will cannot and will not be thwarted, right? You get that? His will cannot and will not be thwarted. But they will try and they will lose. Speaks again. He goes on in that verse. Whom they have scattered among the nations. So the nations have scattered the Jews among the nations. God remembers. He doesn't forget. They have also divided up my land. Is that not what we've heard in the news for at least a couple decades? Land for peace, land for peace, land for peace. If you just give land, we'll give you peace. Then Israel would have indefensible borders, especially now in, the, in uh, more modern times with rocket uh, technology and, and all that uh, kind of stuff that now you know, uh, Hezbollah has as they're a proxy of Iran and, and others. Okay? Israel already has enough of, of issues to deal with with its current borders, but they want those borders to be shortened. Land for peace. You give us land, we'll give you peace. That's not true. We know it's not true. They say that publicly, and I have uh, listened to, and or actually I should say I've read from recordings of what they say to their own people, and it's 100% the opposite. So we're like, oh, they want peace. Why are, why are the Jews acting like this? They want peace, you know? Let's have peace. They don't want peace. It's all a sham. Do not be fooled. Like I said, I have proof that the opposite is the case. I've read it a number of times. The Valley of Jehoshaphat, named from where King Jehoshaphat had a decisive victory, I'm going back a long time ago, is located within the plain of Megiddo. So the valley of Jehoshaphat is located within the plain of Megiddo. Uh, the plain of Megiddo is gargantula, ginormous. I mean, so uh, literally, uh, if memory serves me correct, it's about 200 miles long, 100 miles wide. Literally, the nations of the world will be able to flood down there, the armies of the world, and enter into battle. What they don't understand is that they will ultimately be battling the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords where they will, or actually that place, Megiddo, where we get the name, and as mentioned also in Revelation, uh, the name Armageddon. Armageddon, it comes from that place, the plain of Megiddo right there, the battle of Armageddon. 
We see this also mentioned in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, if you're taking notes. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger, and all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now look at this. To pour on them my indignation. God is a just God. God brings justice. Justice will either be brought upon the head of Christ or the head of an individual who has not put their full trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. There is no other option of payment. No other option of payment for men's sins. And here we read about the sin of the nations in regard specifically to how they have dealt with the nation of Israel. The issues that have taken place for millennial will come to a place of cessation. Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. Uh, now we have the technology uh, for X amount of decades now where they can literally turn off uh, through, I think it's the Ataturk Dam, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, was built, and they can literally stop the water from flowing in the Euphrates River. Amazing. You no know, such technologies existed 2,500 years ago, but God knew what would be. And that's already, that can be done today if they wanted to do it. Amazing, amazing, uh, in fulfillment, in our lifetime. Fulfillment. So, uh, so the way of the kings from the east might be prepared to literally come on down and cross through um, uh, the Euphrates uh, River, which will be dry, on dry ground will be so. Uh, verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouths of the dragon, or the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. 14, for they are spirits of demons. So great demonic activity taking place, performing signs in this time ahead, which will go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That battle. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see, and they see his shame. I'm coming as a thief. You've got to be watchful. Be watchful, he said. We're watchful in God's word. That's why we get into God's word. God's word allows us to be watchful. God's word gives us that ability to see what's going to happen before it happens. Verse 16, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. The nations gathered in Zephaniah 3.8. The nations judged in Revelation 16. They will be gathered. They will be judged by God, by His wrath, by His indignation. The nations will be judged for their sin, for how they have in coming against Israel have come against the God of Israel. We even see, and you don't need to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, we also see that God there in that place, that God will judge the nations on how they treated Israel, um, specifically how they treated Israel during the tribulation. Interesting. Now, the Lord is long-suffering. He's long-suffering. But when there is persistent rebellion of nations against God and their thunderous attacks by their persecution against Israel, trying to divvy up the land of Israel. A day of reckoning comes. A day of reckoning comes. Now Israel is, and specifically I'll say Israel, and specifically uh, Jerusalem, will be the hub of global focus and attention. We already see this, this little bit of, of, of land mass, you know, somewhere around the size of, of Rhode Island. I mean, so insignificant in, in size, but not insignificant geopolitically, religiously, 
strategically as a landmass, very strategic location. Very insignificant in one aspect, and yet quite significant indeed. God can take something that appears very insignificant and make it significant. How many times do we feel insignificant? How many times do we feel even as lesser than? Perhaps you grew up and you had a parent or guardian put you down consistently and make you feel lesser than. How many times were you in school and the school kids made you feel insignificant or lesser than? Or in the workplace, or in college, you're told you'd never amount to anything and you're insignificant. How many times, perhaps, have you been made to feel like or told that even as a Christian, you don't matter? What you say doesn't matter. You're insignificant. In fact, we are in the minority. But in this, the minority wins. The minority has victory. The minority may be the minority, but make no mistake about it, the the minority is very significant because God is on our side. Actually, I should reword that. (laughs) We're on God's side. Like God doesn't join to our side. Okay, I'm going to join, you know. (laughs) We're with the Lord. We're with the Lord. And God keeps his word. And God is faithful. And no matter what you're going through, who you are, what your week has been like, that, that uh, news that you got from, from the doctor, from you know, any number of things this week, issues going on at work. You even wonder if the job you have today, if you're going to have tomorrow. You wonder this, that, or the other thing. But you know what? You matter to God. You matter to God. And you are significant to Him. But the hub of global focus and attention, seven-year peace covenant, that will be entered into with Israel. The temple will be built there. The two witnesses that we read about in much uh, debate and conjecture as to who those two witnesses will be uh, until they will be killed halfway through the seven-year period of time. The time is called the period of Jacob's trouble. Period or time of Jacob's trouble, you'll Read about that. You'll see that in his word, time of Jacob's trouble. How troubling it truly will be. In fact, remember the patriarch, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob. Well, this man, name was changed by God later on, years later, many years later. His name was changed by God to the name Israel. That's where the name of Israel came from. When God named, renamed Jacob Israel. His name originally meant heel catcher. God changed his name to Israel, which means governed by God. He was a schemer originally, and God worked in his heart. He was a schemer originally, but God changed him from the inside out. And as he changed, God said, your name means to change because you're not that man that you once were. You're a new man in me. You, you belong to me. You are mine. And your name will now be governed by God because I govern you. And then he had 12 sons. We call them the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Because from each of these sons, had sons and sons and daughters and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we see a nation being born, a people coming about. And the name of that land, of, of, of those people, of the, of the land mass that they would eventually settle into, is called, was called, and is called again today, Israel, governed by God. But don't be fooled. The land of Israel today does not walk in such a manner as being governed by God. To be honest with you, it's a very uh, godless place in many ways. Oh, but there's all of the, you know, you can go to, you know, uh, to this tomb and you can see this thing and that thing, but they're all old ruins. 
of things that God had done long ago before a people walked away from God. But yes, the land once again, the people once again will be governed by God. God will fulfill it because God always keeps his word. He always keeps his word. He keeps his, and if he doesn't, then we've got a serious problem. You know what I like to say? If God is through with the Jew, then God is through with you. Because if God does not keep his word with the Jew, he will not keep his word with you. But we know that God keeps his word. We know that God keeps his word. So the 12 sons of Jacob, a.k.a. Israel or whichever, their descendants populated the land. Now this period of Jacob's trouble we see in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 through 8. And there's so many. I'm just going to bring up a little bit. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 through 8. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Wow. And then uh, uh, what about verse 8? For it shall come to pass in that day. It shall come to pass. God's saying, you know what? My word is my bond. That's like what that is. My word is my bond. It's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. And that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck. Who's no? Who's yoke? The yoke of the enemy. The yoke of the nations. Break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them. Wow. Or how about this? Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now, if that's a period of time that's on the horizon, I believe, prophetically, scripturally, on our horizon. If that's a period of time that's on the horizon, and in the Word of God, it says, be watchful. It says, watch and be ready. We see this Old and New Testament, then God's people are to be watchful. We are to be a watchful people. We are to be a ready people. How, how, how do you get ready? Well, I'm going to be a, you know, a, a prepper, like I said before. You know, prep this and prep that and, and all that kind of stuff. And hey, it has its purpose for certain emergencies and that kind of thing. I get that. But hey, you can't prep for that. <laughs> there ain't no prepping. Ain't going to happen. Okay? But one way. There is one way. There is one way to prep. One way to prep. Ask Jesus into your heart. Ask Jesus into your life to be your Lord, to be your Savior, to come into your heart, to make you new, to be born from above, born of God. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he cannot receive the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of God. What do I enter? What do I, do I somehow enter back into my mother's womb? What are you talking about, Jesus? You know, the first is a physical birth. The second is a spiritual birth, a spiritual birth. If you have not had that spiritual birth in Christ, then there is no hope for you. I'd be lying. I'd be giving you a, a false hope if I said otherwise. So come to Christ. Trust in Christ. Faith in Christ. Be born again. You see? That's our escape plan. That's our prep. That's my prep. You see? That's where it is. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up. That's Michael the archangel, by the way. Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even up till that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. A horrible time, a horrific time, a terrible time, truly a time of, of gloom, and doom for those who have not received Christ. And in fact, if you're taking notes this morning, you want to talk about the wrath of God 
at that particular time, and you can listen online too on, on the, the, our YouTube channel if you need to, but Isaiah 13, 9, Zephaniah 1, 15, Romans 2, 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, Revelation 6, or 16, 19, Revelation 19, 15, all talk about the wrath of God at that time. It is throughout Old and New Testament, the wrath, not a wrath of God, the wrath of God. But as a child of God, I am not subject to the wrath of God. I'm not subject to that wrath. If you are a child of God, the wrath of His indignation in which He will bring upon the nations will not be upon God's people. Will not be upon God's people. His wrath will not be upon you. Why would anyone think that they would want the wrath of God? I can't understand. I, I can't. There's some things. I, there's things that I can comprehend. That's something I definitely cannot comprehend. Why would you want the wrath of God? It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. Come to Jesus. Like the song from Fernando Ortega, I think it is. You know, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and live. It's a wonderful song. A terrible time is coming. We're going to close this up here in just, a, in just a few minutes. And we'll pick back up in, in these verses here next week. Because there's so much to share. And I really want to make sure that that everyone in this church, because i got to answer to God. <laughs> I'm going to answer to God. God's Word says that I will answer to Him, that we will answer to Him as pastors for these things. I want to make sure that I did my job in letting everyone know what these verses right here, all of these in, in chapter 3 and all of God's Word, but specifically these first three verses, what they're really saying, what they really mean. But turn Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter one verses six through ten. It says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest. Rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Now, they do not know God, and I'm going to stop here for just a moment. They do not know God because of that willful rejection of him. They do not know God because they have rejected him. They have rejected him. And it says, on those who do not obey the gospel. So we see a willful ignorance. When they say ignorance is bliss, well, not based on some of those scriptures that we read on, in God's word this morning. Ignorance is not bliss. They are willfully ignorant and willfully disobedient. They do not know God. They've chosen to not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel, willfully disobedient they are. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. God is glorified, and God will be glorified in the midst of His people. 
I can't wait to observe the glory of the Lord. I can't wait for that day, for that time, how amazing, how marvelous it will be. That time, yes, the the times that are coming upon the world will be horrible upon a Christ-rejecting world, not against God's church. So is there hope? You betcha. You betcha. On the PowerPoint, if you'd go down to the very bottom couple of slides on there, Titus chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. Is there hope? Yes, there is hope. Looking for the blessed hope. Are we looking? Do we get so caught up in in the problems and and, and the things of the day, all the turmoil that goes on in all of our lives, we get so caught up in it that we lose focus? God's Word says one of the things that we are to be focused on, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, purifying us, purifying us. Purifying process is not easy for anything, certainly not easy for any of us, that process of being purified for the Lord. But we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. Some of us need a little more work than others, maybe. You know, I, you know, but <laughs> I'm probably one of those. <laughs> but we're his workmanship. We're his workmanship. Next verse, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, born again, spiritual birth, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is a hope based on facts. This is a hope based on evidence. It's, it's, it's what I call evidential faith. It's, it's not blind faith. It's evidential faith. It's based on the evidence that we have clearly before us. Clearly before us. And thereby we have the hope that we have. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise God. Terrible times ahead. And what's going to take place up until the rapture of the church, I cannot say. It certainly will get worse. They just legalized hallucinogenic mushrooms in Colorado. They just passed uh, into law in California. The curriculum uh, in the schools in California, as if it was not bad enough, is now horribly, horribly awful. And trying to think of what, uh, I I don't remember the exact technical code for what they call it, but just passed, um, it passed the judiciary committee, and then it went uh, on to um, uh, the House, unbelievably, but it's called the Equality Act. We'll talk more about this. It is, I am not kidding you, it still has to pass the Senate. We are hoping, 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 and praying that it does not pass the Senate, and that it does, and, that, and you know, but eventually, I believe it will. You get a different Senate in there than we have right now. They'll keep on trying until they win. And we know the way, the direction things are going. This bill that just passed the House is the greatest attack on the Christian church in the history of the United States of America. Bar None. I will talk with you one day when we have some time to go over it. Absolutely horrifying about what it means for the Christian church in America. It's 
not about equality at all. Not only is it the greatest attack on the Christian church in America by a long shot, it is the, great, the greatest attack on the freedoms that have been awarded to women in America as well. It is a horrible, horrible, horrible thing indeed. You can look it up. It just passed the past couple days or so. But is there hope? Yes, there's hope. If Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life, no matter who you are or what you're gone through, there is hope for you. Have you received him as Lord and Savior? It's not too late right now while you have breath in your lungs. But after you die, there's no second chance then. We've had millions of chances probably up until that point. But, up until, but when you die, that's it. There's no purgatory. It's a lie from the enemy. It's not in the word of God. There's no other chance. Well, I got time to think about this. How do you know? The word of God says, teach us to number our days. We don't know how long we have. Goodness forbid if any of us should leave this place this morning and be in a horrible car accident or any number of things that can happen. Do I say that to scare you? Yeah, actually, I do. I do. You know why? Because it's reality. It's reality. And we sometimes seem to think that we're just going to keep on living and living and living and living and living. Why would you even want to live without Christ in your life? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. If Jesus is not Lord and Savior and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, born again by him, then you need to get on your face before God right here, right now, today. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, my Lord. So much, Lord God, that we see in your word coming upon the world. Prophecy already fulfilled. Other prophecy getting close to being fulfilled. Time is truly short. But the arm of the Lord is not. The arm of the Lord is not short. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you so much that Christ went to the cross for God so loved the world. He went to the cross for sin, to pay the price of sin. Well, how do I know, you may ask, as we're in an attitude of prayer, how do I know if I'm a child of God? How do I know if I'm saved? <laughs> it says in the New Testament, believe on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. How will you know if you're saved? Believe on the name of the Lord. Proclaim Christ as your Savior and Lord. Through faith, put your trust in Him. While we're in an attitude of prayer this morning, you can have the assurance of salvation. You can know that you are saved right here, right now and be free from the indignation of God that he will bring upon a Christ-rejecting world. God's word says, he who the Son has set free is free indeed. You can be free today. If this is you, while we're in an attitude of prayer, and you know who you are, you know the Holy Spirit perhaps is bringing that conviction upon you as we pray. You know you don't have that peace and that hope. And you know that you need Jesus. Will you call upon him right now? If this is you, while we're in an attitude of prayer, if this is you, just hold your hand up high in this place as we're praying. Just saying, Pastor, I need prayer. I need prayer. If this is you, 
if this is you, just hold your hand up. And Lord, I need you in my life right now. And Lord, we pray in this place. We pray for all the rest of us. Those, I pray, I hope, have put our faith in you to save our souls. Lord, may we be watchful. May we be ready. May we not be so consumed with the things of this world that we're distracted from our lovely Lord. Correct us, Lord, where we need that correction and draw us ever so close to you. Grow and strengthen your church here, we pray. For you are our hope. You are our shield. You are our fortress. And we take shelter in the shadow of your wing. All praise and glory and honor be unto you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, and all God's church said, amen and amen. Let's all stand. Don't forget the women's sign-ups uh, for the women's uh, Bible study.